Bill, can I ask you about uh, your role now on the Carbon Task Force? Uh, I mean, there are those who take a, ve a very uh, clear-eyed view of this broader story, and they say it's simple. If only the banks would stop investing or would encourage disinvestment in emitters or carbon-based uh, uh, fuel generators, then then it, this would be um, resolved much more quickly. We'd, we'd be on a, 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 a we'd be on a clearer target to reaching some of the um, the broader climate goals that have been laid out in international agreements. Um, do you think that's the right tack? That uh, instead of having task force task force some meetings, we, we should just get folks like you to stop lending money to those companies that are emitters. Yeah, and of course we're doing that. And we, we, we for example, stopped financing uh, anybody that was uh, that was generating coal-fired power uh, almost three years ago. Uh, we told every one of our clients that is dependent on coal in their in their in their uh, manufacturing or, or production process uh, that they'll need to to uh, phase that out over the next ten years. Uh, all uh, so that that uh, we, from our perspective, uh, can comply with with uh, our share of the obligations under the Paris Agreement. So we're we're taking the steps to reduce the the, the direct and indirect carbon emissions from Standard Chartered Bank in line with, with Paris. So we're doing that. I think other banks are, are doing that to different degrees as well. Uh, and shareholders are divesting uh, companies that, that, uh, that, that uh, produce fossil fuels, et cetera. That's not the whole answer, though. Uh, there's clearly that the world is not going to go to, to uh, carbon neutral or, or net zero by 2050, which is what's required to, to hit the Paris Agreement, uh, without having some really concentrated investments in things that reduce carbon. Uh, and that, whether that's reforestation or carbon sequestration or uh, new technologies that we haven't even uh, imagined yet that can take carbon out of the atmosphere, that, that can reduce or eliminate the carbon that we will continue to put into the atmosphere through the, the cars that we drive and the planes that we fly and the, uh, and the, and the, the, uh, the widgets that we manufacture. Uh, and, and for that to, to happen effectively, we need to have a mechanism for the people who are doing the carbon reducing things to get the money. Uh, and the fact is they need about $125 trillion, $125 trillion uh, over the next 10 years in order to meet the commitments that we've got. Uh, in emerging markets, uh, there's about a $2.5 trillion per annum unfunded need, right? We have to get the money from the people that have it into the hands of the people that, that can actually make the investments to reduce the, the, the carbon footprint of the planet. The, the, the Voluntary Carbon uh, Task Force that, that uh, I have the, the great pleasure and honor of chairing uh, is not sitting around having meetings. We're coming up with very concrete frameworks to create a very robust, big, transparent, and credible market for carbon so that the people that want to invest that money but have a hard time doing it because you don't know what exactly you want to do to get this carbon out of the environment, to get the people with the money to give their money into the hands of the people that do know what to do to reduce the carbon footprint of the planet. And to do that through a market that's got a, a core contract that is transparent, observable, understood, credible, and liquid, right? traded in a, in a liquid way. Uh, we're not that far from having that today, although the, the existing carbon market is a fraction of the size that it will need to be. We'll need to grow it by hundreds of times to meet the objectives that we've got. But the, the opportunity that we have right now is to harness the power of private markets to solve this problem. And since the private markets are the primary emitters and the primary funders of sustainable projects, what better opportunity is there than right now to bring those together through a liquid and transparent market? That's what we sought to do. We've got 50 of the most knowledgeable and most committed companies in the world working on this. Uh, people who are big emitters, people who are big investors to reduce emissions, intermediaries, uh, and everybody in between, 50 and another 75 sitting in a consultation body that are providing expert advice. We have world-class experts who have come together to solve this problem. I think the opportunity is now, and we'll do that. But, Bill, can we solve a, a global recession, a global pandemic, and climate change at the same time? They're not inconsistent, right? I mean, the one thing we know about solving the, the, the global pandemic, or at least recovering from the global pandemic, uh, and dealing with the, the economic carnage that has ensued from that pandemic is a substantial amount of spending. And now there's a big question what that's going to be spent on. We know that a lot is going to be spent on, on basic human services to, to help people through the, uh, the tragedies that have be, befallen so many different lives. 
But we also know that there's every intention to have a massive increase in infrastructure spending. Let's just make sure that that infrastructure spending is targeted in a way that satisfies the, the, the climate objectives that we have at the same time. To do that at a time when interest rates are at or around zero for most of the global economy is a perfect time for us to, to make a very strong commitment to addressing the, the, the carbon challenge at the same time as we're addressing the economic challenge and the recovery from the pandemic challenge.